17, beginning at verse 20. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Again, this is Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 20. Once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Men will tell you, There he is, or here he is, Do not go running after them. For the Son of Man in His day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, the fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken, the other left. Where, Lord? they asked. He replied, Where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. All God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. As we read through Scripture, we will come across many things that are difficult to understand. There will be different paradoxes, apparent contradictions, and also mysteries that we just can't fully comprehend with the human mind. One of those would be the debate between free will and predestination. Do people make the free will decision to follow Jesus Christ? Or were they chosen before the beginning of time by, by God for who would believe and who would not? And that debate goes on. Or maybe there's some blending of those two. We talk about the Trinity. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's kind of hard to understand. How are there three persons but one God? That's a mystery. What about Jesus Christ and His two natures? Fully God and fully man, but one person. How do we reconcile that? Is He 200%? There's a lot of different mysteries in Scripture, and another one is this idea of the kingdom of God. Because we read things in Scripture that seem sometimes to contradict. We see Jesus say that the kingdom of God is near, that the kingdom of God is within us. But at other times, they talk about the coming of the kingdom of God in a future sense. So what is it? Is the kingdom here now? Or is the kingdom yet to come? Well, what we believe is that the kingdom is here already, but it's not yet fully consummated. You see, today we live in the spiritual reality of the kingdom. But when Christ returns, that physical reality of the kingdom will come. And that's what we hear and read in today's passage. We read about the kingdom within the present kingdom, and we read about the kingdom that will come, that we all wait for. And so I want to look at that today and help you understand that this paradox or mystery of the kingdom actually makes complete sense. And so it starts here in verse 20 of chapter 17. 
Once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Now, as you read those first couple of verses, it may not be as apparent as it could be, but all of this conversation is in what's called the present tense. If you read it in the original Greek, you can obviously see that they are talking in what's called the present tense, the here and now. The Pharisee is asking the question, when is it going to come? Because in the Pharisee's mind and in the minds of the Jews at that time, the coming of the kingdom of God, the coming of the Messiah was going to be an event. An event where the Messiah comes back as a conquering king, he would revolt against the Romans, he would lead the armies of Israel, and he would reestablish the kingdom of his father David, and they would live in glory as they did in the ancient times. They were looking for a physical, historical reality. But that's not what happened. We know that didn't happen. And what Jesus tries to correct him is, it is not going to be a physical kingdom at this time. What you are expecting to see today, Mr. Pharisee, is not what is coming now. Right now, the kingdom is not a physical kingdom, but it's a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom is here in spirit, but not yet in its reality. And Jesus says to him this word, the kingdom is within you. Some of your uh, translations may something different. The word is entos, and it literally means inside. It's inside of you. If we look back to the only other time this word is used in Scripture, Matthew 23, verse 26, Jesus said, Blind Pharisee, clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. And again, that word entos. So Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is inside of you. It is within you. Now we've heard Jesus talk about the kingdom of God in similar ways before, going back to Luke chapter 10, verses 9 and 11. He said that the kingdom of God is drawing near to you. It is coming close to you. And that word was in Gizo, a different word, but the kingdom was drawing close to you. In Luke chapter 11, verse 20, he says, the kingdom is coming upon you, which was Thanos. That word meant it was upon you. But now he's saying it's actually within you. It's almost a progression as he described the kingdom of drawing near, being upon you, and now it is within you. And this shouldn't surprise us because Jesus spoke most often in manners of the heart. We would talk about the law and how the law had to be obeyed in a physical play, way. Take the commandment about adultery. He said, you've heard it said that if a man commits adultery, he's broken the commandment. But I say that if a man looks at a woman with lust in his heart, he has already committed adultery in his heart. Jesus was getting down to the heart. He was getting down to what's inside of you. Because this is where the kingdom resides. And as we draw closer to Christ, and as we have the Spirit come to live within us, the Scripture tells us how we have a changed heart. We have a changed mind. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us when we believe. And so the kingdom is truly within us. The kingdom is present spiritually. Even though Jesus came and defeated sin and death, we know Satan still runs about still causing havoc in the world. And so while we know the kingdom is here, we know the work is not yet completed because sin and death are still at hand. But as we consider the kingdom within us, the first thing I want you to do is think about your own thoughts and words and deeds. Do your thoughts, words, and deeds express a kingdom of God that lives within you? Are you acting toward your neighbor? Are you acting toward the Lord the way that would be pleasing to Him? 
And you can also consider in what ways are your thoughts, words, and deeds absent from the kingdom of God? What are those things that David prayed, Lord, search my heart? What are those things that you need to ask the Lord to search your heart that He might find those sins that are deep in there to drive them out? See, we are living in that tension. We're living in that tension of the Holy Spirit lives within us, but also our sinful nature still thrives. And so on one hand, we do what's right in the sight of God in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds. And we should continue to do that and grow in maturity and faith. But a part of that growing in maturity is recognizing where we have missed the mark. And also drawing those things out, repenting of them, and setting them away. So that we continue to grow in the Spirit of God. Now as Jesus draws this conversation with the Pharisee to a close, He then, verse 22, turns to His disciples. You see, his disciples were expecting the same thing the Pharisee was expecting. The disciples are expecting that the Messiah would come in power and glory and overthrow the Romans and establish the new kingdom of Israel. And so he turns to them now, and he's going to tell them about that physical reality. He's going to tell them about that kingdom to come and when it's going to come. He starts here in verse 22. The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Men will tell you, there he is, and here he is. Do not go running after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. So what Jesus, and as you read this passage... What you see happening in this conversation is all of the verbs are in the future tense. Where the prior conversation was in the present tense, now Jesus is speaking in the future tense. This is the kingdom to come in the future. And he's correcting them to some degree. He's saying to them, it's not going to be what you think. It's not going to be a revolution that rises up and there's battles and events and things like that that take time and eventually we kick the Romans out. No. When the Son of Man returns, when He comes back the second time, it is going to be like a flash of lightning. It is going to be immediate and unexpected. No one knows the day or the hour when He will return. But it will be as lightning flashes. When lightning flashes, you can see it from miles and miles around. Somehow, by God's mystery and God's power, all the world is going to see Christ return when He returns in glory. And when He comes back, it's going to be in an instant. Now He prefaces it and says in verse 25, but first He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, which we know is going to happen Good Friday. He's going to be rejected. He's going to be crucified, dead, and buried. And then He'll rise again. He will ascend into heaven and then He will return. And we're talking now about that second coming. He then goes in to some historical examples to help them understand what He means. When He says to the disciples, it'll be like a flash of lightning, that's kind of hard to understand in and of itself. So like the good teacher that He is, He gives a couple of concrete examples from history. The first one is the flood. Verse 26, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, then the flood came and destroyed them all. Boom, in an instant. People weren't expecting it. They were eating and drinking. They were getting married, giving off in marriage. They were going about daily life, not even seeing the signs, not hearing the preaching of Noah, or recognizing the fact that he's building this giant ark. But no, they go about their days. Blind. Obscure. Oblivious to the reality of God's wrath. And then on that day that the flood came, they're all destroyed. All destroyed in a day. It'll be like that with the coming of the Son of Man. He gives the second example, which is Sodom. Verse 28, it was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building, just like the other story. They're going about life's daily events. Again, oblivious. 
But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be just like this on the day the, man, the Son of Man is revealed. Verse 30. So he gives these two concrete examples to help them understand. I'm telling you, disciples, when I return, it will be sudden, people won't expect it, and there will be destruction. Those who are not with me will be lost. He then goes on to tell us something that becomes somewhat interesting. He says, on that day, verse 31, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Now what he's talking about here, there's a couple of things, and there's a really a spiritual part of it. When he says, whoever try, verse 33, whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. When we read life, we generally think physical life. And that Greek word is zoe. Zoe means physical life. That's where we get zoology, the study of life. But the word that Jesus uses here is suke, which we would read it as psyche. P-S-Y-C-H-E. Your mind, your soul. So Jesus is not talking about the physical life, but He's talking about who you are as a person. Again, He's talking about this inner person, this soul. He says, whoever wants to keep his life or his soul, whoever wants to remain in the spiritual condition that they are, are going to lose that. The people who want to retain who they are, what they are, apart from Christ, they're going to lose it all. But on the other hand, whoever loses his life will preserve it, it says. All right, whoever gives up their old life will have the new life. All right, whoever turns from their sinful nature and turns to the Lord in repentance and faith will have that new life. And the word where is translated as preserve, zoagoneo, is a word that comes from two words, zoan, which again means life, and ginomai, which means to become or to be born. And so what, if you want to literally read this, it says those who give up their lives will have a new life brought forth. Will have a new life. And so that's a really beautiful picture of what it's going to be like. Those who refuse to turn from their old way are going to be destroyed. But those who are willing to give up their old life for the new life in Christ, will experience this renewing of life, this new life that has been brought forth. He then goes on to describe it even more, and in these next couple of verses, it's what most people would call the rapture. Verse 34, I tell you on that night, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken, the other left. Now, if you look at your Bible and you see that there's a verse 35 and then verse 37, and you ask yourself, where's verse 36? Well, that's because in the more current translations, they've taken out verse 36, the old verse 36. So if you've got an old King James, you probably got verse 36 in there. If you've got an NIV, you got verse 37, 35 and 37. What happened to verse 36? Well, verse 36 reads like this, then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. And that is also repeated in Matthew 24, 40. So why is that missing? Just as a side note, I guess I'd say, when we look at the oldest copies of the Gospel of Luke, that verse is not there. That verse in the second century copies is not there. It only shows up in the fourth and fifth century. And so scholars think that the scribes added it in to make it parallel with Matthew. Now, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day for the context here or the meaning here. It doesn't change the meaning. But I wanted to point that out to you in case you notice that your Bible doesn't have a verse 36. You're going to explain why. It's not a typo. So, in the old version that you might have, it'll have three examples of people being taken and left. 
in the newer versions, it'll have two examples, but it doesn't matter, two or three, the meaning doesn't change, and that's the key. Somehow, and we believe, as in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that people will be raptured. The believers in Christ will be taken up into the air, and you've all heard about left behind, I think. All right, so those who are believers in Christ will be taken up in the air, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we will be with Christ forever. And the, those who do not believe are left behind. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. So many people believe, I believe myself, that this is a description of the rapture. So when the Son of Man comes on that day, that will be a part of it. The people will be taken up into the air. <clears throat> and so then it comes to the final verse, 37. Where, Lord, they asked. Again, they're still trying to understand this. And he replies to them, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Which is a kind of hard thing, again, to understand. It's a proverb, probably, from back then that we don't fully understand. The best translation I could give you today's English would be, where there's smoke, there's fire. All right? When it happens, you're going to see it. You're going to know where it is. You'll know it's happening when it's happening. And so again, he is not going to tell them. It says in the Scripture, Jesus doesn't know. Only the Father knows the hour, the day that the Son of Man will return. And so he closes this passage with that, you'll know it when you see it. All right, When you see me coming in glory, you know it's that day. When you see the people who are not believing, trying to save their lives, you're going to know it's that day. When you see the people who are believers who are turning and looking at the sky in praise and glory and being lifted up into heaven to join Him in the air, you're going to know it's that day. And that's the day that we're looking for. But that day isn't here yet, and we don't know when it will be. It could be today. It could be a thousand years from now or more. I don't know. But what I do know is the Scripture says He's coming back. The Scripture teaches us that the kingdom of God is here within us. Therefore, we should manifest it in the world. And the Word tells us that He's coming back to establish His kingdom for all time. And so as I close, I want you to consider the already of the kingdom and the not yet. As far as the already is concerned, I've already mentioned to you, I want you to search your hearts. Where are you in word, thought, and deed building up the kingdom of God? Where are you hitting the mark? Keep doing that. That's good in the sight of God. But where in your heart are you missing the mark? What sin must you draw out by the help of the Holy Spirit so that you can continue to walk more faithfully? That's the already part. But the not yet. Christ's second coming. What are you doing for that? One thing that you need to be doing is sharing the Gospel with others. You need to be out there and telling people about what Jesus Christ has done for you. Everybody has a story. Whatever your testimony is, and it's a good story. Whatever caused you to turn from your sin and turn to the Savior, that's a good story. Go out there and share that with people. That's the first thing. Invite them to come to church next week. All right, it's Easter Sunday. You know people are going to be looking to come to church. Praise God they want to come to church on Easter Sunday. Don't look down on anybody because they said, oh, I'm only going to come on Easter Sunday, but I'm not going to come back again. Praise God they came into church that one day. And pray that they'll stick on to it. But bring them to church next week. And then the other thing I want you to do in considering Jesus' second coming is praise God that He's coming back. All right, for all the evil that we see in the world, all the things that make us distraught, He is going to set everything right. He's the only one who can set it right. He's the only one who could bring you back to Himself through His life, death, and resurrection. And He's the only one who's going to fix this broken, sinful world. So at the end of the day, we all must give praise and glory to God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I mentioned that the kingdom of God is within us. 
All right, the Holy Spirit comes to reside inside of you when you turn to the Lord in repentance and faith. You turn from your sin, you turn to the Savior. Each and every one of you who believes has the Holy Spirit within you. That Holy Spirit produces spiritual gifts for you. And those spiritual gifts, I say, are for you. They're not really for you. They are for you to use 